Okay, so where to start with the story behind this mid-ranged mess? Back to the beginning is perhaps an idea. A few years ago I wasn't an active gamer. Am I a gamer now? I don't know. Anyway, I didn't have a console or a gaming PC at the time. So when I wanted to try out some games, I used a small home theater PC, a Dell Inspiron Xeno HD410, their attempt at a Mac Mini at the time perhaps. I removed the hard drive after it eventually died. The bulk of the device was the hard drive, which is now used in one of these PCs. The Dell ran Windows 7 and I installed Steam and discovered Dirt 3, Grid, Arkham Knight and Arkham City etc. It was an AMD based PC with Radeon graphics. And which is interesting, since everything else I've used up until now has been Intel based. Eventually I had to upgrade and wanted a desktop that would be more powerful, have better cooling and potentially also be upgradable. Not that I really knew how to properly upgrade a PC at the time. So I bought this system from a system builder here in Finland sometime in 2015. A pre-build as they call them on YouTube. A bang for buck model as listed on their online store. And pretty basic looking back on it now I guess. I wasn't in a position to build my own PC at the time. Maybe I should have been. They shipped the build to me with a pile of manuals, warranty cards and a USB recovery drive for reinstalling Windows if necessary. And no bloatware included, which was nice. It's built in a Cooler Master case, an older style that isn't painted and with slots up front for optical and hard disk drives. The DVD drive I never really used and at this stage it's disconnected. I decided to put the stickers that would have been included with the major components on the front of the case. I guess I must have been proud of my new gaming toy at the time. Well given what I had been used to in terms of PC hardware up until that point, I guess it's no surprise. The motherboard is a micro ATX type from Asus, which looks tiny when placed in a mid tower style case. Installed was an Intel Core i5 quad core CPU, a 4460 I think, and 8GB of DDR3 RAM, an SSD for Windows, a standard hard drive for data, and an EVGA NVIDIA GTX 970 graphics card with an overclock. If I recall, the GTX 970 caused a commotion when it launched, as it was listed on paper as having 4GB of video memory, when it actually had 3.5. It's been a good card though and it still is. I made some modifications to the build over the years, while learning a little along the way. The first thing was to replace the pre-installed Intel stock cooler with a Cooler Master Hyper 212. The power supply was sometimes making noise, an issue that was present since the machine had first arrived I think. It was an issue with a bearing in the cooling fan if I recall, so I arranged an RMA with the system builder and replaced the power supply with this Seasonic model, which I had to install myself and which was in a way my first foray into building my own PC. And then a few years later I upgraded the RAM adding 16GB of DDR3 for a total of 24GB. No way, that's fake. Right? Right? And finally, I recently added an additional case fan at the base of the case with a dust filter behind it to pull some air into the case. Not such a major improvement no doubt, but it can't do any harm to have it there. I connected the extra fan via a splitter with the rear case fan since there were only two fan headers on the motherboard. My son is now using this PC and seems happy with it so far. We took it apart and rebuilt it, checking the thermal paste on the CPU and replacing hard drives etc. A way for he and I to practice assembling a PC as well. He had been using a laptop for gaming and Ubisoft's new Hyperscape Battle Royale wouldn't install, so thankfully the GTX 970 did the trick. And the missing slot is where a PCI based Wi-Fi card used to be, which I've now placed in the new build and applied some tape to try and keep the dust out and it connects to the internet using the ethernet port now instead. The tape doesn't look so bad 
if you don't look at it. <laughs> and so on to this new build and which was the idea behind this video. And this may sound silly, but I'll relate the story anyway. I wasn't planning to build a PC. Before I started researching in detail, I didn't really consider it an option. I was checking what the same system builder was currently offering, and what the stores were currently offering in terms of pre-built PCs from brands such as Asus, MSI, Lenovo, HP, Dell, etc. One of the stores had a discount on a HP Pavilion gaming PC with an Nvidia RTX 2060, so I went to a store to have a look. An example on display was missing a port on the back of an RTX 2060. The sales guy hadn't noticed and he admitted that it looked odd. I asked about the PC upgrade path and the ability to open the case to dust it out, which he seemed to indicate may avoid the warranty, which didn't sound correct. Anyway, I got the impression that he himself wouldn't buy one, so the decision to look into trying to build my own PC was made. The HP Pavilion and similar models from other brands I discovered were using OEM specific graphics card variants, along with, dare I say, no name brand motherboards and power supplies. And overall those types of systems are not designed to be upgradable, however some brands might suggest that they are, or to be opened up for servicing by regular consumers. Those who just want to buy a PC for a decent price, which will just work and return it or call for service if it doesn't. The case is again by coincidence a Cooler Master, a master case H500 ARGB to be precise, hence the two 200mm RGB fans in the front, and A as in addressable RGB, but more on that later. I wanted the fans for their potential to cool the case, not their ability to paint a rainbow. It's quite a bit larger than the previous build. To be completely honest, I never checked the height when I ordered it. I only knew it was a mid-tower style case and would be compatible with my choice of motherboard. The front I.O. includes two USB 3 and two USB 2 ports, audio in and out, power and reset switches and the hard disk activity indicator. They say you should only use the onboard audio via the motherboard I.O. at the rear though. Most of my audio devices however are USB based right now anyway. This raised area acts as a carrying handle which is useful while adding to the height of the case of course. There's a magnetic dust filter up top which is nice and which many PC case manufacturers are now including as standard, and slots for adding additional fans, or a radiator for a water cooling system which can be placed in the front of the case as well, and a removable dust filter below the power supply with the feet of the case providing sufficient space for airflow below. The left side panel is tempered glass, a common feature these days, and removable via these flat metal screws. I guess they wouldn't look so neat, but I would have preferred just thumb screws like those used on the other side, as these flat screws can sometimes be tricky to remove and replace. I don't have any light sources in the case other than the RGB logo on the graphics card, which I could control with software if I'd wanted to, but that would be just another application to install in Windows that I realistically don't need. So there isn't much to look at I guess. It does allow me to make sure that the fans are spinning though. It ships with a metal mesh up front including a dust filter which is nice. This can be replaced with a clear plastic window included with the case and the incoming air would then need to enter through the sides of the front assembly. I'm not sure if I'll ever replace the mesh with this included plastic window. I got my son to help me build the PC, or at least I tried to teach him what little I already knew. We took Linus's advice and checked for a working post before placing the motherboard in the case. What does that mean? Thankfully all parts appear to be okay so far. The case came with the motherboard standoffs pre-installed 
and labels on the front panel connectors. The headers on the motherboard were all clearly labelled as well, which is nice. The components I purchased between June and July this year, and some parts were hard to find, along with potential shipping delays due to many items being out of stock. 2020 has been one of those years. I went with an AMD based system with an MSI X470 Gaming Pro Max motherboard with a McLaren P1 on the box, not the basis of my purchase decision. Can you even like run games with that, you know? The reason was that it was ready for AMD Ryzen 3000 series CPUs out of the box. The rear I.O. includes a PS2 mouse and keyboard combo port, two USB 2 and DVI and HDMI out ports for a CPU with integrated graphics. Then a selection of USB 3.1, Gen 2 and Gen 3 ports, Ethernet and audio in and out, including optical audio, which I might try out sometime. I've been experiencing some minor issues when using USB devices. While using this new PC, I noticed that when using apps like Chrome or Word, the cursor would freeze, causing a delay while typing. While researching the issue, I posted a question on Reddit and received the following responses. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. <laughs> Overall, it seems to be an issue with the AMD chipset drivers and motherboards in general. In addition, it wasn't clear when building the PC which version of the chipset drivers to use. Some recommend using those from AMD, while others suggest downloading those available from the manufacturer of your motherboard. Here you can see on the right an example of the chipset drivers available from MSI, which appear to be newer than those available from AMD on the left. So perhaps the chipset drivers from the manufacturer are best to go with in this case. Potentially something to watch out for if you're planning to build an AMD based system. Watch out for the number of USB devices you plan to connect and try connecting to another USB port if you experience any issues. We can compare the rear I.O. here with that of the older build, and as you can see, VGA ports are a thing of the past I guess, along with having DVI out on a graphics card. The power supply is a Corsair 650 watt, and again it's non-modular. I saved as much as I could here and there. The AMD CPU is a Ryzen 5 3600X with 6 cores and 12 threads, and one of the reasons I chose it was the fact that it would include a CPU cooler in the box, which some said would be sufficient if you weren't planning to overclock the CPU. Not that I ever overclocked the Core i5 either, and I replaced the stock cooler in that case as well. Anyway, I did install the AMD cooler to begin with, I think they're manufactured by Cooler Master and found that it made a noise when in operation. I read that the power profile settings in Windows controlling fan speeds might be an issue, but that didn't appear to be the problem in this case, so I decided to swap the stock cooler for an Arctic Freezer eSports Duo which is quiet. The RAM is 16GB of HyperX DDR4 at 3600MHz, and the graphics card oh where to start. Yes, I was aware of the pending Ampere announcements from Nvidia, and as I record this in early September 2020, the details are now official. I wanted to upgrade from the Nvidia GTX 970 and Intel Core i5, and it was about time to do it. The GPU is a Gigabyte Nvidia RTX 2060 Super. No! What? What? Why? No! With 8 gigabytes of video memory. Many have said that the super variants were a response to competition from AMD, and that Nvidia may not use the TI or TIE and super product names again, but we'll see. 
I followed the Nvidia announcements and the new graphics cards look good. Prices are competitive too. In response, I guess, to the forthcoming next-gen consoles and whatever AMD is planning to launch still this year. If and when I upgrade, the CPU would need to change as well. And at that point, perhaps also, PCIe Gen 4 based storage would be included. I run a single 60Hz 1080p display at the moment and I don't have virtual reality. If anything, I guess an Nvidia G-Sync compatible display would be nice to have. I tried the Minecraft Windows 10 ray tracing demo which was interesting. And I've also connected the PC to a 4K TV we have here a couple of times, just to test it out. But that's not something I plan to do on a regular basis. Actually, I bought the card based on the fact that it will also include a USB-C Virtual Link port. It seems that some models include it, some don't. This one doesn't have it for whatever reason. And the new 30 series cards from Nvidia don't seem to include it either. I have noticed that the drivers from Nvidia for the RTX 2060 Super appear to include a USB-C driver. So I'm assuming that since I don't have one, there is perhaps no point in including it. And I understand that the concept of including a USB-C Virtual Link port to support virtual reality on graphics cards has now been abandoned. Among the games I've tested so far, I set the course that Competizione runs ok on high settings, and I've been able to max out a few others. It was nice not having to tweak settings in order to eke out as much performance as possible. And Adobe Premiere runs a lot faster too. For storage, I installed a mechanical hard drive for games and other data. I might add an SSD at some point later. And for Windows, an NVMe SSD. Actually, the one game I installed on that SSD is Assetto Corsa Competizione, but I don't think it really makes a difference. And finally, a note on the RGB setup for the two fans at the front of the case. The ARGB connectors for the fans include three pins, whereas the headers on the motherboard are four pin. So connecting directly to this motherboard and using software to control the RGB colors wouldn't be an option. So instead, you need to use the included hardware controller to switch between RGB color presets. There was a note on the case manual to connect the controller to the reset switch. This wasn't immediately obvious for me, so it took me a while to figure out that it meant use the reset switch on the case to change the colors. I'm not really bothered with the RGB, but for those looking to use it fully, this setup might be both confusing and perhaps a bit of a disappointment. And that's pretty much it for now. Oh, and I gave the stickers that came with the parts for the new build to my son, which he placed on one side of his new PC. If you enjoyed the video, consider leaving a like, and if you haven't already, consider subscribing as well. Hate YouTubers, that's my pro tip. A comment is always welcome, along with sharing the video with anyone you think might be interested in checking it out. And if you don't mind adding to your notifications, click the bell icon in YouTube to be notified of future videos as well. Until next time, thank you.